Now, I get and totally understand that AEW Dynamite is not always going to appeal to all of my wrestling senses. I really do get that. I understand it. You know, there's just something I have to accept. That some weeks, the show is going to appeal to me a lot more than others. But I can certainly tell you that this week's show in no way, shape, or form appealed to me. It clearly felt like this show in particular was skewed towards more of a truly hardcore neckbeard nerd type of demographic. And as a result, I thought the show absolutely sucked. Can't win them all. And by God, in my opinion, Dynamite didn't win anything this week. Like, can we stop with this crap, these eight-man tags, these tag matches that don't have any purpose, that don't have any reason, that don't do anything, kicking off stupid Dynamite? Like, if you got to get your rocks off and your jollies off to stupid, typical, flippy, fuck, bucks of sucks bullshit, then I guess so be it. Go watch their catalog of matches for the past 10 to 15 years throughout the business. I don't need to see this crap here. Whether it's the cringy, acclaimed entrance rap to now all of a sudden after the match, SCU's talking about they're a tag team until they lose again, then they're longer. Who asked for that? Who cares? Stop throwing out all these meaningless stipulations that have absolutely nothing to do with anything, that have nothing that's been built up to them at all. Like, who the hell cares? It's just, you go into these typical flippy F matches that the Bucks of Suck have, there's no heat, everybody just gets their crap in, you don't know what the hell's going on, you don't know who you're supposed to get behind, there's no story told, and nobody benefits from it. And yet, after all these years, you still got people that will sit there and tell me, the, yeah, the, the business has passed you by. Well, if this is what the business is supposed to be, then maybe the business is just stupid. At least we got to hear after this from the former world champion, John Moxley. That's great. I, I thought it was very nice to finally hear from him. And I thought his promo was really, really good. But I just don't understand why it was so hard to wait so long for him to really come back and truly talk about everything and da 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 Like, why does it have to be like that? I mean, if the champion, the former champion in this case, doesn't care, why should the fans? Which I could also speak to with the world champion that you have now, Kenny Omega. <sighs> if you take an hour and a half to really reference him in any way or feature him in any way, maybe he's a crampy world champion. And even if I don't think he's a great world champion to begin with, AEW, you're not doing him any favors. Seriously. So, again, why didn't we open the show with this John Moxley promo? Let's break up the flow here. Break up the structure of the show. Break up the monotony of the formula that we seem to see consistently week in and week out. Or even better, maybe, kick off the show with a hot start with a match that actually has story behind it. That actually has a purpose for being and existing. And that's Wardlow versus Jake Hager. There is actual story here. There is a purpose for this match. There is a reason for this match. It also represents something different than what you would get throughout the vast majority of the show. You don't bury this a half hour in. You feature it front and center at the beginning. Then you follow that up with a flippy fuck Young Bucks match. That, to me, makes more sense. That way you're getting contrast. You're getting variety. But if you're trying to appeal to new fans and getting them to latch onto the show, I guarantee you and promise you, they are much more likely to watch Wardlow versus Jake Hager and then stay than they are some flippy fuck eight-man tag match. Sorry, that's just the way it is. I was a little stunned that uh, Wardlow sounded like he did on this promo. I don't know why I thought he would sound uh, less intellectual and more intense. I don't say it's a bad thing. It was just a bit of a surprise. But the match was solid. And again, because there was a reason to care about this match, there was a reason to get emotionally invested in this match. Uh, Chris Jericho being on commentary, uh, you know, it has moments where it has luster and appeal and other moments I'm tired of him screaming all the damn time. And that's coming from somebody who screams a lot. Uh, but, you know, the way that they played this out, Wardlow wins. That was kind of a shock and a surprise, but maybe it shouldn't be. And then afterwards, you got MJF going and seeing Jake Hager and, you know, kind of give him a rah-rah speech. Like, that was well done. I thought this was well executed. What I don't understand is you bring in somebody like Snoop Dogg. Like, Snoop Dogg is a legitimate star. Like, if we talk about stars like Snoop Dogg, you talk, talk about pop culture icons, 
and you want to measure their true level of star power, you go based off of what I call the Peter Arnold scale. That's my dad. So we use the Peter Arnold scale to determine just how big of a star somebody is. My dad never listens to rap. My dad hates rap. He's always hated rap. He thinks it's a dumb form of music. But that son of a bitch loves him some Snoop. The point I'm getting at is, is he doesn't even like the form of entertainment that Snoop does. And he absolutely is a mark for Snoop. Like if you're talking about the Peter Arnold scare, scale, you're talking about people like Snoop Dogg and Jackie Chan and, you know, like big time stars, legitimate big time stars. And some of you are going to laugh. You threw Jackie Chan in with Snoop Dogg? No, you got it wrong. I threw Snoop Dogg in with Jackie Chan. Get it right. But you bring Snoop in. And the first segment he appears in, you're letting Private Party and then mostly Matt Hardy do all the talking. Why? This should be centered around Snoop. Snoop's the one that people would pay to see. Snoop's the one that's the vastly bigger star. I have nothing wrong with Private Party and Matt Hardy doing some type of segment and doing some talking. But Snoop should not just be standing there putting a bottle of juice on the freaking uh, <laughs> on the table, and then that's pretty much all you see from them. That's dumb. That's not how you utilize these guys. I did like uh, the beginnings of the Darby Allen Brian Cage weigh-in. You know, it ties into next week's match. This is, again, something else that has story behind it. This is something else where you've got Team Taz that the company is behind, so that's great. Darby Allen, the company's behind. So you like to see this. Like, you have two wrestlers that this company's invested in, Two com wrestlers that this company has featured in a way that makes the fans want to care. I'm down for this match next week, and this segment ties into that. But then you get the part where now Darby Allen wants to go after everybody with a skateboard. Up to that point, I'm thinking it's okay. But you know, inevitably, what's going to happen? Here comes Sting. Shit, again, why did in this segment open the damn show so at least people can see Sting? But I think you get to a point here where you got a bit of a problem. You've got a 61-year-old man with a bat trying to live out his glory days of old, and a young man like Darby Allen, who's all of 170 pounds, wielding a skateboard, and the entirety of Team Taz is running scared for their fucking lives. Like, in theory, maybe that makes for good TV, and perhaps it does, but then it also makes those guys look really bad. And yes, those things still matter in professional wrestling. And speaking of things that matter in professional wrestling, how the hell are you going to pull Luchasaurus out of next week's tag match for Marco freaking Stunt? If I was going to put a kid into next week's tag match, they'd give me Brody Lee Jr. Because I guarantee the moveset's probably not any worse. And I guarantee you, compared to Marco Stunt, Brody Lee has way better mind for the business and certainly has more personality, charisma, and overall talent in his small body compared to Marco Stunt. How dare you pull the Luchasaurus for next week's tag match, you jerks! Sucks. Sucks. Ah, this show was aggravating this week. You know, and every week I see Cody Rhodes is automatically an irritation. But he should not be struggling this hard to beat a jobber like Matt Seidel. Look, I don't think Cody's a big star. I think he's being propped and positioned in a way that he's supposed to be, but he's not. Cody, in a really big wrestling company, is a perfect mid-card type of guy. He's a bedrock foundational pillar guy. A guy that you have people work with either on their way up or on their way down in the card. There's nothing wrong with that. You need guys like that. Not everybody can be a top shooter. They can't be all top stars. A guy like Cody can have significant value to your company. But what he shouldn't be doing is having to hit two crossroads in order to finish off a jobber like Matt Seidel. And the way Matt Seidel is featured in AEW, he is totally and completely a jobber. When you have one of your top guys in the ring against a effing jobber, you don't have a fucking battle 50-50 match. You don't do that. This whole toxic mentality that has creeped through professional wrestling that everybody's got to get all their crap in and nobody wants to make the other person look bad. Therefore, they make everybody look bad in the match. This crap needs to stop. It doesn't help Matt Seidel. And even more importantly, from this company standpoint, it doesn't help Cody Rhodes one bit. So stop doing it. You know, especially if he's got Snoop there, like, get in, get that match done, let Snoop get in his spot, and then move the F on. Like, after the match, you get all the running and stuff, and then you got Snoop hitting the big spot that's going to go viral on social media that you're going to see on the um, media, you know, you're going to see on TV and so forth. That Snoop to be smashed looked horrible, but that's not what matters. That's not important at all. 
I mean, to be clear, Snoop looked about as terrified last night getting up on the top ropes as he did back in the early 90s trying to beat that murder rap. How many of y'all even remember that? Probably dating myself here as much as anything else, but, you know, I felt like they could have done a little bit better job incorporating Snoop, but they got the big Snoop spot in. And it might look like trash, but it's Snoop. That's not what it's about. It doesn't have to look great. If it looks great, it's just a freaking bonus. But if anything, I could say it's more appealing because you got a star like Snoop. He's not a wrestler, so it shouldn't look great. That's what it should look like. That's believable. That's realistic. So I'm okay with that. It's the match, though, where Cody's having a struggle to beat Seidel. And before you go to commercial break, Cody's on his back. When you come back from commercial break, Cody's on his back. That doesn't make anybody want to tune in and watch a Cody Rhodes match. That's not how you make stars. It's horrible. Not as horrible, though, as the AEW Women's Championship match with Sheeta and Abaddon. Look, I'm sorry. I tried to be nice, but Abaddon looks like a crappy creator wrestler that a six-year-old did. And you know I'm right. It looks, she looks really, really bad and dumb. And maybe if I thought her gimmick was cool and not stupid as hell, maybe I would feel differently. But she looks and works and acts like a crappy six-year-old's creative wrestler. And it's no surprise to me that a crappy feud led to a really crappy title match, and that's exactly what you've got. Like, this stuff right now, what AEW is doing with their women's division, they've basically made themselves a glorified WWE Divas division with longer matches. That's what you've got. And then you're promoting next week, that Serena Deeb's defending the NWA Women's Championship, and it's like, why is she defending it against Conti? I think it is? Why do we have a second women's title on your show when you do a terrible job with the first one you got? Like, I can't imagine anybody defending what they do with this women's division. You can disagree with me like hell about the Bucks of Suck and Cody and all these different things. Fine. To me, that's where it could be about perspective and opinions. That's cool. It's more fun when we do disagree. But how the hell can you disagree with this crap? This was just bad. Bad, bad, bad. Bad wrestling is bad wrestling. It doesn't make you sexist to call out when the ladies are doing garbage, just like when the men do garbage. You got it? Like, be better. It's not that hard. But, again, what I would expect out of a company that waits an hour and a half to feature their freaking world champion. I mean, why would I sit there and be surprised that this company didn't know what the hell they're doing half the time? Like, I can't imagine for the life of me who thinks it's a consistently good idea to wait an hour and a half to feature the world champ. And they seem to do this week after week with Kenny Omega. Like, it's one thing if you talk about him throughout the show and you show him throughout the show, but then you really feature him at the end. That's okay. You're building up to the champion. That's cool. But to basically pretend that your world champion doesn't exist for the most part for the first hour and a half of the show is dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. And it's exactly feeding into one of the major concerns that I had about this company way back at the beginning before it even technically started its first television in October 2019 is that these clowns don't know how to do weekly episodic television. And it shows. And then when you talk about making stars, look, I don't think Omega's a star. I don't think he's really, truly North American World Championship material. But he's your world champion right now. So in that case, you need to protect him like hell. And you need to give him every opportunity to shine. And having him go out there and struggle with a dude that doesn't mean shit like Phoenix for almost 20 minutes is one that's going to pop all the nerves because of all the frickin' flips and kicks and no selling and false finishes, but it doesn't do any good for any damn body. And the whole notion here was that he took the belt to impact with Don Callis and what's going to happen next. Like the whole follow-up is terrible to it. And you're not going to sit there and tell me, oh my God, all of a sudden now the Good Brothers appear. This is something good. Now after several minutes, you finally get some guys to come out and fucking try to take on the Good Brothers and it's a bunch of jobbers. And then the Young Bucks finally come out and oh, yippee! From one week to the next, you never know what the hell the Young Bucks are supposed to be any damn way. But now, we're putting the band back together. <laughs> That's so stupid. A perfect example of every fan that thinks they can book an invasion angle. That's what this is. It feels like. 
And they're proving that a lot of them don't know what the hell they're doing. They would do a terrible job of it. Especially if they like this crap. You geek out to the Bullet Club bullshit all you want. It's stupid. It is. It's not going to bring in new fans. It's just not. Like, if you want to say, okay, we're going to surround our world champion with other people because we want to make him look stronger as a leader of a group. Cool. I get that. But you already have a product, a brand, with too many effing factions and groups as it is. Adding another one to the schmas doesn't help anybody. This show was not my favorite this week. It was bad. I had a hard time staying focused, staying interested. It just, it just didn't do it for me. And you know, I understand that not everything needs to be centered around Jeff. I, I get that. Uh, but damn it all. Like, it shouldn't be that hard to do a decent episode. And no throwing matches in with flips and kicks because I actually have some standards, unlike some of you. I can get the job. What? Well, you got a problem with me? You got, oh, so you've been the one. You haven't? Well, what do you want? Really? Oh, you think so? All right, well, come on, bitch. Let's get after it. Come on, motherfucker. Come on. Bring it. Bring it. Ah! 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 Where'd you learn to fight like this? Ah! Ah! You son of a bitch! I'll be back! I'll be back! I swear to God, I'll be back! You haven't heard the last of me! I mean it! I'm calling the cops! I don't care if you're white or not, they'll actually arrest your ass! Bye, bitch. Marcus Smart here. And I've been on the shelf for way too long, and I've listened to just about enough of the Schleg Daddy's reckless, liable slander. And I've had it. That's it. That's it. It's a new year, and it's the same great Marcus Smart for all of you here on OTRS Central. And let me tell you something. This week's AEW Dynamite was fantastic. The Young Bucks doing what the Young Bucks do, showing themselves to be the great athletic wrestling dynamos that they always have been, leaving you on the edge of your seats wanting more, more, more. And then, my God, that main event was something truly epic. Kenny Omega defending against Phoenix. It's like a dream match. And if it had happened in Japan, it would be minimum six and a quarter stars. But that's got to be a five-star main event if there ever has been one. And then to top it all up, the Good Brothers, the Good Brothers, oh my God, they're on impact. What are they doing here? Don Callis, you nefarious mastermind evil genius, what do you got going on in there? The Good Brothers are aligned with Kenny Omega. It's chaos. It's anarchy. Oh no. The box. The Young Bucks! The band's back together! The band's back together! The Bullet Club is once again about to run professional wrestling! Because the Young Bucks rule! The Good Brothers are back, baby! And Kenny Omega's the world champ, and he's one of the best motherfucking wrestlers in the world! And if the Sled Daddy don't like it, if any of you don't like it, you can kiss Marcus Smart's ass! Because this, ladies and gentlemen, in 2021, is a new year, best year ever! God damn it, AEW Dynamite hit a home run this week! I can't wait to watch Impact next week. I can't wait to watch AEW Dynamite. Bullet Club business is back, baby.